Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Abhi Hulati, and as I mentioned earlier, I am the manager of performance analytics at Duke Energy Renewables. And today's topic is how we used machine learning to predict failure in one of our wind turbines. I'll give a quick overview of who we are. Duke Energy Renewables is one of the country's largest owner operators of wind and solar fleet. We have a presence across the country, and we also operate a few third party wind sites. So, so we have a tremendous opportunity to leverage machine learning and advanced analytics to improve automated, <coughs> to improve automated detection of impending failures. And we, we have gone, gone through a digital transformation process over the past several years, and we went through the pain of collecting data and cleaning it and storing it, and we went through several iterations. And let me give you some more context here uh, as to where I'm speaking from. My team is kind of in between operations and IT. And so, so we, we get the worst of both worlds. <laughs> um, so, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about machine learning. I, I won't go too much into the technical aspects of it. Um, but when I refer to subject matter expert, the context here is performance <coughs> engineers. Um, who, who, are, who are basically electric, electrical and mechanical engineers. Um, it's a centralized role, and they are in charge of making sure that our assets are running well, they're performing well. So this is what a wind turbine looks like. Um, I won't go through the details, but the takeaway here is that it's a complex piece of machinery. It's, it's expensive, it's got lots of sensors, and that's great for us, for data analytics because lots of sensors means lots of data to feed our models. And for a use case in particular, um, I'll be talking about contactors. And these are essentially uh, big relays. And there's six of them on each turbine. And their purpose is to make sure that when a generator kicks in, it ramps up smoothly and synchronizes with the grid. And the issue here is that certain models of turbines have some design flaw, and contactors tend to fail more frequently at, at one of our sites than at other sites. And we identified this as a good use case for, for, for this machine learning project. And a turbine will go offline if any one of the six contactors fail. And, and the business use case is that when a contactor fails, uh, the turbine goes offline for two to 10 days. Um, it takes a very experienced technician to go in and figure out what's wrong. It's not a simple matter of just replacing it because the fault could be upstream and, and then it will fail again. So, so what we need here is, th this is the ideal machine learning process in, in my opinion. Um, where we want to empower subject matter experts, the performance engineers that I mentioned, to, to take ownership of, of this project. And what we want is to have them access, have access to the data, they, they clean it, and they know what type of algorithms to run, and run this machine learning iteration. And based on our experience, it usually doesn't take just one or two cycles. You know, we have to iterate multiple times. And eventually, we'll end up with a good solution. So we partnered with Seek to try um, one of their new tools called QSearch. And this tool is focused 100% on subject matter experts being able to operate this machine learning implementation. And, and what we're trying to do is take IT a little bit out of the picture IT is still involved in the data infrastructure and giving all the backbones. But the subject matter expert is in charge of answering these four questions, which, which is in their domain. And this is what they do. This is their job. They've been doing it for several years. They don't need to know Python or any programming language. They don't need to know all the nuances about supervised and unsupervised learning. So, so we are bringing machine learning to, to the masses, democratizing it, so to speak. And, and one of the advantages of QSearch is that it can also run continuously once it's validated. And 
it will give automated notifications when something's going wrong. So these are the four questions from the previous slide. And it's just represented graphically here. The first is to identify known past failures. Uh, in other words, we're just defining the problem. What are we looking to solve? The second step is to give QSearch a plausible list of all the signals that might be that may serve as leading indicators of the fault. Um, it doesn't have to be exact, because as I said, we can iterate multiple times, and it's safer to err on the side of giving it too many signals than too few. The step number three is to tell the model approximately how much time um, in advance of the fault that there's information in the signals that's, that's relevant to the fault. Um, so let me elaborate a bit. It, it depends on the system that, that we're interacting with. There are certain fast-moving systems where the signals change so rapidly that you may, only, you may only have to give it a few minutes advance notice. And there are other systems that are very slow moving. In our case, we are dealing with currents and relays. So, so we settled on a one hour time frame. And the last step is to tell the model what does OK look like. So, so what's normal behavior? So this is the actual Q, Q search setup that we used. So uh, that's the typo that, uh, so we are looking for error code 364. Um, the control system tells us uh, that's pretty easy to get. Um, there's a list of signals that we went with in the first pass as having potentially useful information. And, and as I mentioned, we, we decided on, a, on one hour time frame and we define certain parameters as to what's normal operation. In the bottom right corner, um, the, there was a window of the panel, which, which I'll show in the video. So what, what's going on here is this is a video capture of, of a run, and it's easier to do this um, than running it live. And what you see are the eight signals mentioned, the rotor speed, the wind speed, generator speed, and the three phases of the current, and active and reactive power. This data is a little bit noisy. Um, so let me see if, if, it's, uh, if the video is playing. So while the videos, um, while you figure it out, I'll, I'll just keep continuing. So, so this, oh, th there it goes, okay. <laughs> um, so, all right, so, so what we did is we, we got our raw signals and then we cleaned it up. Um, and, um, and then we defined what's, what's, the, what's the problem we are looking to identify, and that's alarm code 364. This entire data set was for a two and a half year period from one one particular wind turbine. And you can see that the issues mostly occurred within a two, two to three month time frame, and that's what we zoomed into. So it, it happened in early 2019, February to April time frame. Okay. So the, the next thing to decide was, um, was on the alarm precursor. And as I mentioned in my previous slide, we settled on a one hour time period. The, the way it works is we, we told the model, this is what you need to look for. This is how you, you should train the model to identify target 
uh, the target behavior. And then we also told it what's the baseline behavior. As you can see what's highlighted, we settled on one to two hour time segments in the same general time period when there were no error codes, the generator was running, and when active power was zero. Okay, um, and then we, we let it run and, and it identified a whole bunch of time periods where, that we could pick from. We could choose them all or we could select them, select a few of them. And with, with this particular run, we selected for the target period the first two weeks of March and we selected all the precursors. And for the baseline, we took the first from each cluster. One way to select data is to just drag it, the cursor and it, it just it picks every selected time period within that range or you can individually go through and select a time frame. Um, this is an advantage of QSearch in that the subject matter expert can explicitly tell the model how to train, them, how to train it. So, so we had hundreds of time periods of baseline and we chose a few of them. There's also a greediness factor here and this tells the model whether how aggressive it needs to be so, so there's a certain gray, gray area between the target zone and the baseline. And we, we let it run with a neutral value of 50. Now, it takes QSearch roughly 30 seconds to a couple minutes to run, depending on the processing power. And we'll just show you what results it came up with. In this instance, there were 12 QSearch results, so which is here. And there were 11 false positives sorry, 11 true positives and one false positive. And in a couple of slides, I'll, I'll go into details on exactly how we define those. So what's going on behind the scenes? Uh, there are a whole bunch of models running and the user doesn't have to interact with these. Uh, QSearch automatically selects which ones fit the model, the, fit the data the best and comes up with the best possible result. And this is where I talked about democratizing uh, machine learning. Well, we don't need the user to be experienced in machine learning or to be a data scientist in, in order to use this tool. Um, as for the results, the, the output are the predicted um, failure modes, and there's also a ranking of contributing signals. And this is important because with certain machine learning um, algorithms, it's a black box and you don't know what's going on inside. And then it's hard to tell your management to trust it. Uh, the advantage of knowing what's actually contributing lets the subject matter expert um, do a sanity check and make sure it's actually working well. And there's more behind the scenes um, things going on. Um, the, the user can go and look at these, but it's, it's optional. Uh, the other key thing is that once the model is fully validated, it, it can run all the time and send automated notifications. So how well did we do? Um, so these are the definitions we started with. Um, so a true positive we defined as a prediction occurring within five hours of the fault. So five hours prior to the fault. A false positive was that the model said that, hey, there's something wrong, but there was no fault that occurred within five hours. And a false negative was a fault without any associated true positive. So for the full two and a half year time frame, we, decided, we identified 12 actual events. So, so I manually went in and verified that there were 12, 12 times that the error code 364 came in. Um, and there were 11 true positives and one false positive. What was really impressive was that there were no false pos positives in the two year time frame leading up to the outage. And, and I think this was really impressive. And the only false positive occurred right in the middle of all other true positives. So I think what happened was a part was about to fail, but for some reason it recovered. And maybe the model was actually too sensitive and almost caught it. 
And you'll see here that eventually the part completely failed. So, um, <clears throat> and then we went in and replaced all the contactors and there were no other actual error codes or uh, predictions after that. So to summarize, um, what, what are we going to do next? So this was a trial run. You know, so we went with one use case that was interesting where data was available and that seemed like a good candidate. And we wanted to get up and running fast and wanted to see if this even works for us. And, and the results are extremely promising. So, so, so we want to next expand this model to the rest of our um, turbines at that site. And also, more interestingly, um, look at other, other failure modes. Um, that, that, that will be a lot more complex, but they're, they're also far more financially um, rewarding. Uh, if we are able to catch a generator that's about to fail, and we can manage that, um, that change in a proactive manner instead of reacting, um, it, it's, the return on that is in hundreds of thousands of dollars per event. So, so the, there's a huge potential here that we're trying to capture. Um, the other conclusion that I came to was that analytical tools are really powerful when, when it's in the hand of the subject matter expert and not isolated within an IT team. And the reason for this is twofold. One is that the subject matter experts have get a sense of ownership and they have control over it and they can trust their models. And the second thing is that they can iterate rapidly and not rely on, on IT processes or, uh, and there's reduced friction in the process there. And in conclusion, the, the value to us from this trial run was that you know, it, it currently takes us two to 10 days to diagnose a fault and to go in and repair it. Being able to predict this failure, where it, it helps us to manage inventory better and avoid extended downtime. So, so that concludes it, and I will take questions as part of the forum.